the stage, we have coming up Dan, who is actually going to talk about the new illiteracy in America, which is actually quite interesting. Um, for a while there, I almost kind of considered myself a Luddite. So it's going to be kind of interesting to see all these new ways we communicate and what that kind of does from his perspective. So this is, this is very exciting. Um, Dan, I'm guessing you, you come out of Massachusetts or? No, I come out of, uh, well, I was born in Massachusetts. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, the accent's still there, but I am in Annapolis, Maryland. Nice. Okay. So, so definitely not out of Oklahoma. So that's the cool thing about these virtual cons. We get to have people from all over the United States or world even in some cases. And in this case, you don't even have to leave your home. Um, you can still give us all this great knowledge and, and those kind of things. And so- I want to leave my home. <laughs> it's been here since March. Um, yeah, I believe that. Yeah, so it's it's getting a little um, cabin fever probably. But so do you have slides or anything to give on this? Uh, yes, I do. If, um, um, uh, can, um, I've got my, my, my slide deck up here. Can you... you open up my video or here let me go ahead and see if i can prompt you to share it yeah i think i can there's there's technology out there i hear there is <laughs> uh let's see if that will do it did you get a prompt uh, okay slide? let's do it okay Perfect. that's me and um hey, there's dan that's me and that's <laughs> enough that behind me that's not the view from my place i i can't afford a view from that place. Uh, that would be pretty expensive, I bet. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Um, let me start this. Can you see this? My first slide? Mm, no, I, I still see you. So. Okay. Um, um, if you if you hit the share screen button, let me see if there's another, because you should have access. Let me let me maximize the Zoom meeting and put share screen. Yeah, here we go. Bet you that's the stuff right there. Oh, there okay. we go. Okay. All got right. It. And yeah, I, I see the slides, and I guess if you go ahead and put it in presentation mode, it should be all good. Yep. Uh, let me go ahead and put this in slideshow and from the beginning. Okay. Excellent, Dan. Well, I'm going to go right. ahead and let you have it. And thank you again for your time for giving this talk. And everyone, uh, Dan, the new illiteracy in America. Okay, uh, thank you to B-Size Oklahoma to uh, invite me to this. Uh, I, my company is Loyal Dog Consulting, a cybersecurity consulting and advocacy firm based out of Annapolis, Maryland. I do have customers in Oklahoma, and that's why I heard about B-Size Oklahoma. I've been out to Oklahoma a number of times. Uh, I think Tulsa got screwed over, and it should have been the, the Tesla, uh, Tesla thing should be in Tulsa, but, you know, no one listens to me. Anyway, uh, a little bit about me. I am. Um, I started Loyal Dog Consulting last year, after uh, working in Washington D.C. for almost 30 years uh, with various trade associations in the energy sector. In 20, 2005, uh, the association I worked for needed to start up a cybersecurity committee, and. Back then, nobody really knew or cared about cybersecurity. Well, we, I started it, I spearheaded that. And it, we had companies such as ExxonMobil, Valero, and others, uh, big names in the oil industry. And today, it is one of the strongest voices for energy in Washington, D.C. when it comes to cybersecurity. So uh, that, that's me, but uh, my background is not technical. So my presentation today is not gonna use a lot of technical terms. Uh, don't don't send um, hate mail to me on uh, because of that. But I think that this, this issue needs to be discussed. Okay, when I think about when I think about technology, I think about different times, and I look at television shows set in those times. Now look at this, Friends and Seinfeld. We all remember watching that. Some of us watched it as kids. Some of us watched it with our kids. Look at the technologies they used back then. In friends, they might have had, um, they might have had some wireless phones. They might have had some, you know, they might have done faxes. They certainly didn't have smartphones. They certainly didn't do texts. Uh, Seinfeld was the same way. Their their um, technologies were for great for the time, the 90s. 
What if they had those technologies today and they just hadn't evolved? They'd be considered Luddites and really wouldn't be able to function today. And that's the problem we've run into. We learn to read. We learn to read by a time we're in first grade. And the National Center for Education statistics say that the United States has about a 79% literacy rate. And the, the reason it's 79% and not higher, because I checked this out, it was due to uh, new immigrants and dis disenfranchised people. But I want to talk to you about a literacy rate that's a lot lower than 79%, and that is technological literacy. Wikipedia defines technological literacy as the ability to use, manage, and understand access technology. And you see they kind of go into here with using the internet and databases and web browsers. Technolo technological literacy has been around for decades. It predates the internet. It predates most of us. Just an example. My parents used to tell me that they bought their parents my grandparents, a TV set in 1959. They had never had a TV before. They set it up, the thing probably weighed 500 pounds, and got three stations. And they turned it on, turned on I Love Lucy or something like that, and they left my grandparents. My grandparents didn't know how to turn it off. They had to get a neighbor to come in and turn off the TV set. They weren't technologically literate enough to know how to turn that off. And they weren't stupid people but that they weren't up to date on the technology of 1959. Now, I'm going to tell you a story to illustrate technological literacy. And this didn't take place in 1959. It took place in October of 2019. You see on the left, that is one of uh, my chow chows. Um, I have four chow chows. I am a member of the National Chow Chow Club, which represents chow owners and breeders all over the world. I'm the educational chairperson for that club. And the board last fall asked me to put together a webinar on dog health first aid that could be streamed out to people all over the world and they would be able to see it. I thought this was great. I'd done webinars before at work and at uh, Loyal Dog. It'd be great. But one thing I totally forgot was this was going to be a different audience. I had a vet from Tampa who was up to speed on webinars, so there would be no problem there. But I made a few mistakes. First, I went with a free webinar site. I didn't go with Zoom or um, Microsoft Teams or anything like that. I went something that was, was uh, free. And knowing that today's the audience for this would probably be more like the people on the right side of the screen, I wrote down directions in great detail. And then I got the questions. People would call me or send me an email saying, what channel will this be on? Can I view this through my flip phone? I'm going to have to have my grandson come over for the weekend. I can't check email unless he's here. I should have taken that as omens of what was going to happen with this webinar. Went ahead with the webinar on a Sunday evening. The vet's fine. I'm fine. I open up everything, and I hear all this background noise. So I ask everybody, please mute your phones. A few muted their phones. Lots and lots of background noise. Please mute your phones. Now, this, this webinar is being recorded, and I had to keep saying, please mute your phones, because no one could hear the vet talk. There were, there were dishes and people having TV on and everything. And finally, I ended up going and muting everybody manually. 120 people I had to mute. That took some time. It ruined the webinar. Yeah, they were able to get the, the message across, but. I was so frustrated at the end of that. Now, here's the thing. The participants on this webinar were not idiots by any means. These were retired veterinarians. These are people who were professors of genetics in places like Harvard and Minnesota. These people were subject matter experts when it came to animal husbandry. Some of them have even testified before Congress. So they're not idiots. They just didn't know how to work with a webinar. 
And I had thought that, you know, maybe they were somewhat um, behind. No, they just weren't ready for it. And we run into that all the time. And where do we run into it the most? The workplace. You know that the IT manager has a different level of te technological knowledge than the receptionist. Also know that the receptionist can transfer a call much faster than the IT manager. It's only human nature to be proficient in the things you use every day and not be proficient in, in other areas. And you know, that worked very well on a day-to-day -day basis in the office until now, 2020. COVID-19, the majority of the world's white collar workforce is now telecommuting. We're using terms like Zoom, Microsoft Teams as part of our daily lexicon. Online meetings, online happy hours, online B-sides. Yeah, we, we all got pushed into the deep end of the pool. Some of us were ready for it. I've worked at home since last year, so I was ready for it, but not everybody was. And the problem was they were out of their comfort zone. They were forced out of their comfort zone. Let me give you another story, and it hits a little closer to home for me. My spouse had to work from home in March, first time ever in their 30-year career. Seeing that coming, I set up a separate Wi-Fi for them and uh, made sure they had everything they needed here at home. However, their company had no VPN, had no telework policy, had nothing. And this person, that my spouse has a master's degree in engineering. It was crazy. They ended up using Facebook Messenger to, to uh, send documents to each other. Some of these documents were a little sensitive too, but that was happening and is happening millions of times a day around the world. Now, I'm not gonna go into the COVID-19 security issues and a number of uh, presentations here on that, but wow, is it open to security issues when you have people that are not technically literate and they're trying to get by by the seat of their pants. And let's look at what the future holds for us, okay? Technology in a post-COVID-19 world, what will it look like? I'm hoping that we will see a post-COVID-19 world sooner, um, but here's some things you gotta re remember. Technology does not revert, okay? We are not going back to dial-up modems. We are not going back to the big brick phones. And we're not going back to 386 computers. No, no, we're going forward. Even with the telework and the COVID-19 and all of that, technology marches forward. We're marching right to 5G networks. Probably within two years, we'll all be using 5G. There's, there's quite a lot of stuff going on with 5G right now. And what this also means is the age-old argument of security versus convenience is going to be paramount because when people are working at home you want the same convenience you have in the office i saw that with my spouse i saw how frustrated they were when they couldn't get into a meeting or because they didn't have the right camera on their old computer that they had at home in order to participate i saw that because at work, they can just go down the hall and go into the meeting. And when people are frustrated, they are going to try anything to get the job done. And that means security will be put back on the back burner. But technology is increasing and faster and faster. How does one keep up? And you saw me just trying to uh, get this stuff up. And I've done Zoom webinars plenty of times before. We're dealing now in a age of TikTok, Reddit, WhatsApp. Those of us who have kids, the kids know this stuff a lot better than we do. But should we be aware of technologies that we don't actually need to use today? I mean, do I need to use TikTok today? Do I need to use WhatsApp? No, not no. I I Microsoft. Um, office suite is what I use most of the day, like all of us. But there's also other technologies out there. And another thing we have to deal with with all these new technologies is this. 
people in 2020 are stupid and proud of it. And I'm not, I'm not going to get into politics here at all, but more people than ever are saying, I don't want to learn this. I don't need to learn this. I don't want to update my password. I don't want to do this. And these people are the ones that fall for scams. In 2019, thieves stole more than $19 billion in online scams. I don't even want to even take a guess as what it will be in 2020 with everybody working from home. I was on a InfraGuard presentation yesterday, a, a panel here in Maryland, and one panelist brought up, and he's from the IT sector, there's been a 900% increase in phishing in the last three months. We all know how to look at phishing, but they're upping their game from what I hear, and so they're catching lots and lots more people. And some of them might be your coworkers, Others could be family members. How many times have you heard this in your office? You read this and you, uh, you understand what they're, you, you probably put faces to some of these and people you know in your own office. It's very frustrating for IT managers. And to be even more frustrating is not when these things come from admins or directors, but when it comes from the C-suite, and I, I've seen this before where the CIO or the CEO cannot work with the new technology. So you have to go backwards in order to keep your job. You're sacrificing security for convenience, but you can't make the head honcho understand that. But there is something you could say to the head honcho. Uh, I've, there's an old story that a, uh, an IT manager was trying to get their budget approved. And the CEO said, we've never had a hack. Everything's fine. I'm not going to approve it. Matter of fact, I'm going to cut it. We're spending too much money on this. We're not getting the ROI. So the IT manager was very frustrated. And as he was leaving, he turned to the, to the, panel of C-level executives and said, you know, if somebody hacks into our SCADA system and they blow up a refinery and there's environmental damage and property damage, the shareholders and Congress and the FBI won't be looking at me. They'll be looking at you. They got their budget approved. <laughs> so, uh, so you have to deal with all of these as an IT manager and I've never been an IT manager. I've worked with a lot of them. I can always empathize with them. I've never pushed them. But seeing that I worked with cybersecurity, I had a place in my heart for them. And we know what all this eventually turns into. Lack of concern or knowledge on cyber hygiene because people are trying to get the job done any way possible. Identity theft, frustration all around. And for you guys, compromised networks because right now everybody is out there and you're trying your best to keep them up to date with security and you're getting some pushback from them and a lot of us feel your pain on this now will an increase in technological literacy stop this yeah i'd like to say yes but no no it won't uh, what it can basically do is it can mitigate the damage, and uh, that, that goes a long way. But you'll have people that will cause something, and then it would be like um, uh, that, that character on, I believe, I don't know if it was Growing Pains or one of them, but Steve Urkel, who kept on saying, did I do that? No. Well, you do have that. But... This only will work if people work together to fight technical illiteracy. And we must, each one of us must do our part. And to you people who out there who are dealing with um, making sure everyone is up to date and dealing with the crazy questions and the fixing the same thing over and over again, let me give you a, a tip from somebody who is not a technical or an IT person. And I heard this from 
from somebody at RSA. Empathize. Don't roll your eyes and don't patronize. Because you want the people to take you seriously and don't talk down to them because they're not going, then they'll stop listening to you. What can you do? What can you do at work? You don't suffer the whiners. Um, just turn them out unless they're signing your paycheck. Tune them out as much as you can. The lion must take its pill. Now, this picture on the right, um, I have, as I said earlier, four chow chow dogs. And when I try to get them to take a pill, or I'm sure any dog owner can empathize with this, it's very much like that, that picture. But you have to make sure that everyone follows cyber hygiene procedures. No excuses. And, you know, you can get the HR department to join you. Now, come on, let's, let's admit it. Everybody hates HR. Everybody hates IT. So you two can get together and be the evil empire. IT comes up with a message. HR helps you deliver it. And best thing of all is if you can get the C-level executives to back you up on this. If they can do it, anyone can do it. Now, um, there's also plenty of education companies out there that are willing to help you train your employees, especially when it comes to phishing. And I'm just going to put in a quick shameless plug for my company, Loyal Dog Consulting. If you want to uh, find out more about any of these companies, uh, please contact us and we'll be able to um, put you in touch with them. End of shameless plug. Okay, your weakest link needs to be the strong. It can't break. It needs to be strong. While the other links might be stronger, your weakest link still needs to be strong. You need to encourage training. Put it in the budget. Make sure your people are, are going to train. Make sure, work through the HR department. Make sure everyone's going to cyber training. Make it a part of their annual review. Let the managers know. Let the people take the time off to go for training and have them write up a report when they get back. The ROI will be great on that. And never think people will think like you. You need to think like them to bring them up to speed. Um, that security is not on the forefront of a accounting manager's mind. You need to put that in there, but always understand that he'll never look at security the way you do. Never assume. But the office is one thing. How about home? Home is a different issue. Remember when we used to get computers and phones and everything that came with these huge, huge manuals that you had to um, put onto a shelf? They don't do that anymore. They're online that you can download. But a manual is like a Bible. It is a big book warning you of things that might happen if you don't follow the directions. When I got my laptop and printer and everything I was setting up, Loyal Dog, in 2019, all the manuals are online. And so I, I made a folder and put them all on there. But you know what else I do? I watch YouTube and I look to see some of the videos on the product that I'm I'm using. And I, I started doing that before I even bought the product. The thing with YouTube is you've got users speaking to users in a user's language. And I could understand that. Now, if you have elderly parents, grandparents, or something that, that are technologically behind. AARP is a great resource of materials. I just wish I had found this before um, that October webinar. Uh, it is, they have a library of YouTube videos done by elderly people on things such as Word, um, Slack, um, um, Zoom, and other things. Elderly people talking to elderly people in a, in a tone and in a language that they would understand. Now, that being said, your grandma doesn't need the same security level as an industrial control system. I mean, come on, let's get real. Um, your family needs to know about what to watch out for and what not to watch out for. You've been putting filters on your kids' computers for years. You might have to do some, some of the same stuff for your grandparents. Um, let, let them know that um, uh, certain sites aren't, aren't that good. Um, 
make sure everyone knows about the online scams. Teach them about phishing. You know, they're probably with an IT manager in the home, they're probably more up to date than a lot of homes, but make sure your, your friends and your neighbors also know that, um, watch out for the online scams and use common sense. You have to use common sense when working with them. They, they are not your employees. They have to use common sense to make sure they don't go into a wrong website, that they don't click on something because it's very easy to click on something when you're just looking and thinking, oh, wow, Southwest, they've got um, airfare free tickets. Oh my gosh, I should go ahead and click this and share it on Facebook. I get all those shares all the time from my friends on Facebook and I say, it's a scam, they're getting your credit card number. But there will always, always be a technological gap. We will all face the time when somebody says, you don't know how to do that? I thought you knew how to do that. Oh, I don't know how to do that. And it's gonna be very frustrating for us. But we need to keep up with technology as much as possible. Now we can't know all the ins and outs of every single software package out there. We need to know what we can work with. We need to know what to watch out for. We need to read what's coming out. We're gonna to have to start learning about 5G. A lot of us learned about Zoom in the past three months and other things like that. But let me go back to my the beginning of my presentation. When I started talking about the technologies, I watched television shows, I grew up watching TV because it was before the internet. And you look at them now and you look at the technologies. Okay, so let's go back through a few. I Love Lucy, the 1950s, one rotary phone, no television. The phone was hardwired on a table in the living room. Mad Men, it was set in the 60s. Rotary phones, multi lines and offices, sure. The big technology was the printer. And when they brought in computers, they took up a whole other floor in the office. And you think those computers have much less computing ability than the cell phone we have sitting right next to us as we speak. Let's go to the 70s in Dallas. Touchstone phones, conference calls, but there was really no way they could reach J.R. Ewing if he was between the ranch and the office until probably the last season when he had one of those giant uh, car phones. Friends, as I said earlier, cordless phones, faxing, some early cell phones and and there has there was talk of emails in the in the later uh, episodes 30 rock which is the most up to date email cell phones voicemail didn't hear that much about texting and when they had video chats they were really primitive so that that's where technology has been and where technology is going we don't know will it stop with 5g it's going to go further than that. We have to keep up and we have to make sure that the people we work with and the people we care about keep up with this. We've got to do our best to bring the technological literacy rate up all around the board because it can do nothing but help us. And it will help people to learn better, to communicate better, and to be better consumers and citizens too. So. I'm going to close with this. In 2030, 10 years from now, we will hear, and chances are a lot of us will say, I just watched a rerun of Modern Family. I don't know how they got by on all that old technology. I also like to add in that we'll probably look on YouTube and see um, presentations from B Sides Oklahoma 2020 and like, Oh my God, what are they talking about? That is just so dated. Well, if you go into YouTube and you look at some old B-sides from even five years ago, it will seem very dated. Technology is on the march and it's marching pretty damn fast. So we got to keep up with it and make sure that we all stay together on this. And I would like to uh, thank B-sides again for inviting me. Uh, that is my contact information here in Annapolis. Um, 
Uh, I'm on Facebook, LinkedIn, and just about everything. I'm not on TikTok and I'm, I'm not on Reddit. So um, I, even I have to learn a few things myself. So that is it. I'll turn it back over to you. I don't know if we have any questions coming in. I don't see any questions yet. Um, I know there's been some good sidebar conversations going on and um, it's very interesting to kind of see it because, you know, from my perspective, 15 years in, um, I've seen a lot of changes and luckily at the same time, it seems like there's still some things that are stagnant or at least being held back. Do you think that's mostly because of maybe those that are in power or those that have the money to make the decisions may not understand the technology well enough or the newer tech or don't trust it yet. I know for me, I don't really trust some of the newer stuff or I, I like systems that are well vetted and those kind of things. Um, but I mean, do you see the, I guess the adoption of technology kind of stifled by lack of understanding or knowledge of that technology? So like if we had a better awareness of what it did or what it was or what it, do you do you think adoption would be quicker for even people that were quote unquote luddite, so to speak? Well, I was at a dinner at RSA, and I brought up this topic, and I said, "How many of you would consider yourselves first adopters? You're the one that's in line to get that iPhone and everything." Ugh, let me, nobody. <laughs> and and I could see that you know, people want the technology. But it's like, you try it first and let me know how it works. That's exactly what I was saying. It's like, well, I'm kind of like a second, third adopter, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, I, I look at this stuff and, and I am that way. I, I am not the first one out the door to um, buy the latest iPhone or to download uh, the latest software. I, I want to see how it is. I, when it comes to companies, it comes right down to ROI. If they're going to do something, they want the return on the investment. And that's why it's tough for IT departments to try to get them to upgrade Windows or Adobe or anything like that, because you run into that thing like, it's been working fine all along. Why, why do we need to, you know, it's not broke. Don't fix it. Well, then it comes to the point that it's not supported anymore and you have to change instead of being a nice gradual change you're leaping forward into something that's going to be very new very alien and that your people are going to have lots of questions because they had been held back long enough so and um the, so that's that got any other questions um I'm, I'm looking through the feeds but one thing i wanted to bring up was because in the end you're like hey Let's try to be gain more awareness and understand these, I guess I'd like to say vocabulary or words. And I like to go back to what you were talking about whenever you were you were presenting it to the CEO of the company, where you had to reframe it. Not necessarily from we need these technical things. It's like, well, this is what may happen if we don't have what we need. And almost speaking the language of either the consumer or those kind of things, I think a lot of marketing and other avenues kind of fail and kind of clutter up the word space to make it even more confusing even for me that does it every day um i even get confused with words because it seems like they're used either interchangeably or it could mean that thing or the other so so having that lexicon is what i like to call it but the, the standard vocabulary would probably help out a lot or what would you say to that i would say your marketing pe people uh, like to use big words. They like to use words they see in other ads. Um, I have vetted a lot of suppliers here at Loyal Dog, and I read a lot of their marketing stuff. And after a while, it's just it just sing songy. It, it's the same stuff. And then when I do meet with these suppliers, I ask them, "What differentiates you from others? Because you say this, they say the same thing, and the other people say the same thing." what makes you different and good companies will come up with that but they don't want to spend that they want to get their foot in the door and so they throw out the you know ransomware they're throwing out uh bitcoin they're throwing out everything um, ai machine and, and, oh yeah ai and iot and now they're really beginning to um 
uh, climb on to getting the um, OT people on board. And um, uh, OT was dealing with cybersecurity before any of us were even born. They were kind of the old people in cybersecurity, but they know their stuff, even though some of their um, um, some of the machines they work with are older than the people working on them. But the uh, marketing can only go so far, um, especially when they start talking about things that I don't think they ran past the IT department or the software developers because it really makes no sense. And I'm, like I said, I'm not a cyber guy, but if I can see it makes no sense, the cyber people can see it makes no sense. Uh, I've seen at RSA and other trade shows where they'll have the people out front uh, that will be demonstrating it. And of course, of course, they're the ones that were, you know, the prom king and the homecoming queen and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You start asking questions to them. They have to find somebody else. And um, that, that, that can be frustrating, but everybody wants to be out there and they want to be different, but they don't want to walk away from the pack. They don't want to be seen that they're only going for a certain niche. And if they can keep it as broad as possible, they'll bring in more people. My problem with that is people will come in, see, see it, and then realize, well, I can get the same thing at another place that's cheaper. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Well, I, I'm not seeing any. I'm looking now to, again, to just make sure. I don't believe we have any okay. questions. Well, you know, I'll just tell you something about cybersecurity from when we started in 2005 with um, the association I worked for. Nobody on the board of the association wanted to follow this because nobody in the oil and gas industry at that time was doing cybersecurity. Then Stuxnet happened and Shamoon happened. And suddenly I'm in front of the board of directors explaining what these things are and why they need to start waking up. And those things will wake up people, but after a while, they'll get complacent. And I don't want to have a cybersecurity 9-11. I don't want to have somebody hacking in to a refinery on the Mississippi River and pouring um, crude oil into the Mississippi. I don't want to have a refinery on the Houston Ship Channel blow up. No, no. We need to convince that we need to keep up with this. It's much like life insurance or health insurance. Uh, as I heard one person explain, you always have the health insurance. How often do you need it? Car insurance. I, I belonged to Geico for many, many years and knock on wood, I haven't had to use it for more than just getting a tow. It, it has to be that way, it's in the background. And when you want it, 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 has, to be, it has to work much like a fire extinguisher. I mean, we all know where the fire extinguishers are in our houses and the offices. When was the last time we tested it? But when, God forbid, something happens, we want that thing to work. Okay. Yeah, well said. Well, thank you again, Dan, so much for your time. Thank today. you. And uh, again, I'm not seeing any any questions, but some good comments that are happening in the track two uh, feed. And oh, let's so, check that out. Yeah, yeah, go out there and uh, heckle people or at least uh, kind of give them your, your point of view and perspectives on, on what the conversation is. But very good conversations. I'm loving seeing the sidebar uh, talks. And again, Dan, thank you again so much. Okay, well, thank you for time. having me. Uh, this is my first B-Sides presentation. And I really enjoyed it. Nice, nice. Take well, care. Yeah, thank you and have a good one. All right, we're going to go into a little interlude here. We have uh, Pinpoint Security coming up here shortly with their little um, vendor presentation spot. And then once we do that, we have the two o'clock coming up, Privacy as a Service. Uh, our very own Nathan Swaney is going to be giving that one. So that's coming up. I'm going to go ahead and go on mute, and you'll just see a nice little B-Sides logo on the live stream. Uh, until then, hopefully the Uber Eats is still working out for everybody. Again, that link is tiny.si forward slash bsok um, there's various links in various channels um, i'll probably put one in the channel just to remind everybody uh, again the swag out there update, update your event bright if you have any questions with that get with us at the registration desk or other elsewhere um, an organizer organizer will definitely help you out with that and then again yeah i'm going to kind of go 
I guess dark for a little bit. You'll just see the B-Sides logo in the background, and we're going to be waiting for Stephen Nelson to come up from Pinpoint Security to give us a nice little vendor spiel. Thank you all so much.
Testing, testing, testing. I, I hear you good. Sweet. Or I hear you well. Sweet. There's English, I might need to say. Nice, nice. Are, are you down there and by the ocean? Uh, no, I, I wish I was. I wish I was. That is, that is, uh, I want to say last year at Orange Beach. So Gulf, Gulf Shores. I was, I was curious if that was one of the pictures from your Orange Beach yearly endeavors. Yes, indeed. We, we did not make it this year. No. So, but that, you know, that's okay. Yeah. They're, yeah. So I guess you have to spend time with your family at home this year. So that was. Yes. But it's time with the family. That's right. At least you're able to do that. That's right. Well, I didn't know how long you want, but we are live. Um, <laughs> yeah. Hey, don't you do it live at B-Sides. <laughs> there we go. Awesome. Uh, as as I mentioned in Slack, uh, you know, doing something a little bit different, uh, and you know, don't have a don't have a marketing deck or slide deck. Not not that I hold that against anybody else of or any of my fellow sponsors for doing that, um, but uh, you know, just keeping it real, keeping it light. So um, you know, this is very much in my mind about building building community. Uh, so I remember the, the very first B-sides that I attended. Uh, it's funny, I think uh, uh, Goff, uh, Michael Goff, you know, mentioned uh, B-sides Austin. That was actually the very first B-sides that I was able to attend. I'm trying to even remember what year it was, but it's it's been a while. It was the one uh, uh, H.D. Moore, I think H.D. Moore gave the keynote, or at least he talked there. Uh, oh, what year was that? I, I don't know. It's been a while. That was like 2012, 2011. That was one of the first ones I bet they had in Austin. Was it so in a I weird also, little shack or was it actually in Round Rock? No, it was, it, yeah, it was, it, it was like just off of 6th Street or right on 6th Street. That was um, the, you actually made it to the first year, I believe. So, uh, cool. yeah, I got, got to, got to hit, see uh, here uh, H.D. Moore and then also uh, heard uh, Jack, Jack Daniel um, give uh, a talk. I can't remember the the, the uh, subject of the talk, but he, uh, I, I remember him saying curmudgeon. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, anyways, so yeah, absolutely. Well, okay. Well, I'm about to get ready to start this off. I'm just looking. Okay. I think we're good on the track stuff and I think the timing is right. I feel good about it. Um, all sure, right. A little early. <laughs> hey, I'm going to give you a little more time maybe. And then uh, if nothing else, I think Nathan, he usually takes all the time he needs. So we're just going to go get started. So I have here with me, Steven Nelson from Pinpoint Security. And you started Pinpoint, what, like two years ago now? Yeah, just, uh, just a little over two years ago. Uh, full disclosure, I, I worked with uh, Jimmy here. Oh, uh, I was about to say it too. <laughs> so, so, and this is, this is, I, this is one of my claims to fame. I, I, Steven, the poor, the poor man actually had to manage me. And um, <laughs> I still feel sorry for it, for ha everything I probably, um, probably did or didn't do. Uh, but no, Steven was very, very, one of my smartest managers I ever had. And um, we worked at an oil and gas company and it was one of the most mature programs I've seen as far as like detection and um, prevention kind of capabilities that were in place, it, mostly detection. Uh, but we had a very robust prevention um, capability suite as well. And, and I don't know, even working with, with Steven after three years, and I, I still think of him as a very, very good mentor to me, as well as a, a very close friend and dear friend. And, and I'm, I'm really surprised even after managing me, he can still call me a friend. And so um, my Steven, wealth of knowledge, you've, it was, it was one of my managers who was like, you know, talk with him. He not only was the developer, not only was managing systems, but also, hey, he had to manage this weird little crazy kid, James, as well as my peers. And so it was, <laughs> he, he had a lot on his plate and it n never seemed to really like be overwhelmed. And that was always kind of nice, but it, I'm, I'm so excited to see you doing Pinpoint. Um, whenever I first heard you doing this job or, or starting this business, I, I really liked it because of the focus and Steven is very focused, very methodical. 
and um, a great coworker and very, very smart person. I'm, I'm just going on here, but I, I, I'm just real excited about what Pinpoint's gonna be doing for our community. And I'm so glad to have you here uh, this year. And of course, we'll, I know we'll have you again next year. So I'm, I'm real excited and um, I'm gonna get out of your way now. So you can go ahead and start uh, giving your spiel. <laughs> no, no worries. No, uh, no, no big spiel for me. I, I actually, I honestly want to take the time and, and talk up B sides, uh, talk up the other sponsors. Uh, thank you to uh, all my my fellow sponsors. You know, this is something that uh, uh, I don't think we were alive when we were talking about this, but I think in talking with James, I actually made it to the very first B sides Austin, uh, and that was my my introduction to B sides. Uh, as a, at the time I was, I think my title was a senior security engineer. I don't know that I was that senior, uh, but, uh, you know, getting introduced to the, the community uh, that uh, we have uh, with B-Sides, um, you know, gave me, gave me a real uh, taste for what a community could, a community could be like. Um, and when B-Sides Oklahoma got started, uh, I was all about it. Um, you know, didn't have the time to necessarily volunteer and help, but uh, loved what uh, what you all have done and continue to do. And uh, once I started uh, Pinpoint Security a couple of years ago, uh, that was as soon as I was able to, to do it, uh, I was going to sponsor it uh, just to give back uh, and, and help out. I There we go. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that was a, a violation of, the, uh, of something, but... Uh, Anyways, yeah, I'm James. James is a big FI fan, and I'm a big FI fan. So love to support local local uh, breweries. Uh, love to support local uh, security conferences. So again, thank you to uh, to B sides. Thank you to my my fellow sponsors. Uh, there's a lot of great companies on the list. Um, I know I know a lot of them. I've worked with a lot of them. So uh, thank you. Um, also. Uh, I thank you to all the volunteers uh, as the, the more that I've been able to attend and, and uh, sponsor, obviously this first year sponsoring, but um, everybody that I've met, they're, they're hardworking, smart, um, do a great job. We are very fortunate to have you all um, uh, putting this on. And, and I know it's a truly a labor of love. So uh, thank you, thank you all. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 you know, at this point, the only other thing I've mentioned um, that's that's completely off the wall is, uh, well, I mean, you know, we're dealing a virtual conference. You guys have done a great job, uh, you know, shifting gears in the situation that we're in. Uh, I would say, from a just a mental health perspective, uh, it's important to stay connected and and be involved in the community, um, even if it is virtual. And, and I would I would throw a little plug in here. Just, you know, anybody watching, hey, if, if you're feeling down, if, if you're, uh, um, you know, having, having issues, reach out, get help, right? You know, that, that goes without saying in our community, uh, you know, especially given the circumstances now, um, you know, just, just say something. Say something, reach out to a friend. Um, but anyways, so again, thank you, James. Uh, thank you, B-Sides. And uh, I, that's really all I had, man. Okay, now I'm gonna now I'm gonna quiz you. Um, okay. But luckily, this is all you should know because you own the company. Um, so, <laughs> what what kind of uh, what kind of focus do y'all have as far as what kind of clients you're all looking for? What kind of problem sets are y'all solving? And those kind of things. Uh, so, Pin, Pinpoint is a uh, I would call it a small cybersecurity consulting company. Uh, yes, I use the word cybersecurity, IT security, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we help we help people uh, uh, on the blue side. Uh, we've actually started to dabble a little bit on on you know breaking things. Um, so because you know that's always fun. Uh, so we do a little bit of everything. Our, our primary focus is I would say uh, mid-sized companies. Uh, most of our clients are anywhere from a couple hundred employees all the way up to you know. Um, a thousand, two thousand, uh, and mainly we we uh, we help teams out. We help security teams out where either they don't have the expertise, um, you know, in house, uh, or maybe they just need a little help, an extra help through a project. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's actually a little really bit of everything. Cool. No, that's that's I, that's 
I bet you that that may be more what you may see getting asked for more than I guess a lot of other things, just because of the lack of maybe expertise on staff, or or just not having I don't know not even be able to fill a spot, let's say. And so you kind of can fill in that spot pretty well with your wealth of knowledge and expertise. No, absolutely. Well, and that's one of the things we see. I mean, I know there's a lot of talk about, uh, you know, a shortage of, of cybersecurity talent, but I honestly, I think, I think it's, I think that's a, a self-inflicted problem. I think people aren't very willing to hire junior people. Um, you know, they're too focused on, oh, I need this senior person. Uh, and honestly, I, I think there's not necessarily a lot of, call it senior people uh, out there. Um, and the ones that are out there are starting companies or are in high demand. And so again, I think there's this, this fear of organizations where they feel like they have to have something that doesn't exist. Um, so, you know, and, and you've got, I, I think I saw something on Twitter, obviously there's lots of stuff on Twitter, but uh, you know, the, the joke about, oh, having, you know, I need to have five years of X technology experience and the the guy was like I created the technology three years ago <laughs> you know you're not gonna you're not gonna find somebody with five years or ten years of you know whatever it is and so, I don't know how many times I've seen that um, it seems like over the years oh we need this JavaScript developer that has this many years on the stack and it's like hey I'm the developer yeah it was three years ago when I made it there's no no one out there that has that yeah. that's so, so hilarious so, um, well and well said about um, the the new talent coming in, the younger uh, uh, cadre of, of, of people that we could actually hire, I think that they, at times with even their limited experience, seem to be able to pick up a lot quicker than even I was. Um, and so, yeah, taking those chances, I think you're exactly right. Uh, and I didn't even think about that. That's a very good point. And, and hopefully we, before all this hit, we were actually looking to hire um, and, you know, as, as things progress and depending on um, how the situation unfolds, uh, hopefully we will get back to the chance or back to looking to, to hire. So uh, I would say that uh, if anybody out there is looking to, to get into cybersecurity or is already there and looking to make a change, you know, feel free to reach out. You know, at this point, don't necessarily have anything going, but uh, you know, the right person comes knocking on my door. You never know. You never know. That's so. opportunity, a chance. So no, that's that's right. that's good stuff. And I, I do have hope. I, I have hope we'll get through this, and hopefully all will be well. But you know, I I I don't know. I have a lot of good vibes from your company, and I, I'm excited what you and Chris are going to be doing in the future. And so anything we can do to help, because we love your help too. So it's it's awesome. Sure. And and again, thank you so much for coming and and giving the nice little spiel about pinpoint. <laughs> well, hopefully, hopefully it wasn't too overwhelming, but, uh, oh, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, James. And, uh, yes, we, we will get through this onward and upward. So absolutely. Thanks thank again. You. Thank you. And, uh, I guess, um, we're waiting for Nathan to join. Uh Oh, um, is, this, is I, this where I need to solve my Rubik's cube? You already solved it. <laughs> no. Oh, I, oh, uh, uh, oh, so, uh, <laughs> um, actually was that, it, no, he's, I guess he's talking about privacy as a service. So a new offering you might be able to throw at. So you might want to stick okay. around and, you know, maybe you'll have like a new little dangler on your site that you can go and offer. Privacy Absolutely. as a service. Privacy as a service. Interesting. I know. Okay. It, it sounds very interesting. So we're about to find out what that's all about. All right. Um, well, I, I always enjoy hearing Nathan talk. Uh, so <laughs> I, I, now are the talks going to be recorded and, and available? Yes. Okay. So we, we did this really cool thing where I guess there's a uh, integration with Zoom and YouTube. And so okay. we actually have all these live streamed to YouTube. And then I believe in post, we're going to go ahead and um, cut it up and get it in tracks and then have individual tracks. Um, I'm not sure how hard or if that's going to happen um, or when, but I believe that's the intent. And we at least have the videos recorded somewhere. Yes. <laughs> So they, they should you know, be at least there for posterity somewhere in the yeah, ethos. And in, a, in another life, I actually, uh, I've started doing some stuff and uh, messing with OBS and- uh, I like OBS. I have, yep, OBS is awesome. Now, are, are you using OBS with Windows? 
Uh, yes, I've, I've used it with Windows and Mac. Um, so I'm using it on my Ubuntu box and I thought it was more of a open source like Linux thing. I didn't realize it was for Windows too, that's cool. No, yeah, they, they've got it for, I think all three, all three platforms. So. Yeah, because it has a, like a nice little streaming as well too, right? Like we can do live streams. Yeah, so I, I, I honestly haven't trusted just doing recording with Zoom. Uh, so I'll I'll do I'll do the Zoom stream, or I'll I'll have like uh, if I'm doing a podcast or something and I have somebody else with me via Zoom, and then I'll use OBS to record it, and then uh, some other software to basically get it to you know a good format before I upload it to YouTube. So nice, nice, and that's OBS Studio, I believe. If you yes. Google that, you can find it. It's open source, yeah. free. Um, but it's it's not a bad tool. I I I do it for all my recordings, uh, for secure ideas. So it's it's very handy and it works. It just works. Absolutely. Which is kind of nice in IT to have something that just works. Well, <laughs> it works and it's and it's free. Wait. You mentioned that. Wow, you right? The, <laughs> you almost never get those two together. Yeah. But yeah. there's a lot of great open source stuff out there. It's amazing what people do in their spare time and give away out of their own goodness of the heart. I. I I wish I gave more money to those people. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to even remember if they have a, like a open source or not a, like a support model or if they have something, but yeah, it's good stuff.